All right, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you do, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 this morning. I have to tell you that my intent was that we would finish Romans 5 this morning until I started to study Romans 5, and then I saw there is no way we can get from where we are to where we need to get in this amount of time. So we're, we're actually slowing it down. There's a lot we need to kind of lay a foundation for this section of Scripture, and then uh, we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit. And I hope that you got a good night's sleep, or I hope that the, the baseball game didn't take too much out of you, or if you need to go get another cup of coffee, now is the time to do that because we're headed into the deep end of the pool this morning, and it's going to require you to be focused and staying with me because this is, this is deep stuff. In fact, Kent Hughes, who for many years was the pastor at College Church in Wheaton, Illinois, says about this section of Scripture, he says it's one of the greatest theological sections of, of all of Scripture, and it's also one of the most difficult to interpret in this book and maybe in all of Scripture. So we're headed into no man's land, and uh, basically what he's saying to me is, good luck, Pastor, trying to plow your way through this section. So pray for me, all right? Let's see what happens. Here's the big idea of this section. We'll just get to the big idea right up front. Paul has laid out in the first half of Romans 5, the benefits or the blessings that come to those who trust Christ. Those who say, I'm, I'm in trouble, I need help, I can't save myself. They, they turn to Christ and they say, I'm going to follow him, I'm going to believe him. He says there are benefits that come with that. You have peace with God, that's what he says in Romans 5.1. He says you have God's grace poured out in your life, that means that all that are all of the blessings of God he's going to pour on you. You can stand in them. You're going to have joy even in the middle of uh, difficult circumstances. The love of God is going to be shed abroad in your hearts, and uh, you're, you're not going to have to worry about future judgment. And best of all, you know God. You have a relationship with God through Jesus. So he says, you've got all of this. This is our greatest treasure. He's saying, if you believe that Jesus is your Lord, you turn from sin, you turn to follow him, all of these things come to you. Now he begins a transition in this letter. The key theme so far has been justification and righteousness. Now he's moving to talk about that as a foundation that brings us union with Christ. Union with Christ is what this section and the next few chapters are going to be about. Now, what do I mean when I say union with Christ? Paul is saying when you follow Jesus by faith, you become vitally connected with him in a, in a way that we can't fully understand. It's mysterious, but you become united with him. And the Bible gives us a number of illustrations of what union with Christ looks like. So let me give you three of the illustrations that help you understand what we mean when we talk about union with Christ. The first is the illustration of marriage. When two become what? One in marriage, there's a union that takes place. They're still individuals, but something mysterious has happened. They've been joined together as one flesh. Paul is saying in the same way that marriage is the union of a man and a woman and a vital connection, so when you become a follower of Christ, you become united with him. In fact, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. So the marriage illustration is there. That's one illustration. Here's a second illustration. He says, uh, when you become a follower of Christ, you become a child of God. You are adopted into his family as his child. You once were a part of another family, you had a different last name, you had different parents, you had different siblings. Now, when you become united with Christ, Jesus is your older brother, you become a part of a new family, you have a new name given to you, your life is different, and you are, a, you are in union with a new family. So the, the picture of adoption is a second illustration of what we mean when we look at union with Christ. And the third illustration is one that Jesus used back in John 15 when he said, I am the vine, you are the what? The branches. And he says in the same way that the branch is united with the vine and can't bear fruit apart from it, in the same way you're now united with God, plugged in, grafted into the, into the vine, and your fruit will be born out of that. So union with 
God, through Jesus, is like that. It's like marriage. It's like adoption. It's like being a part of of the vine. These are pictures God gives us to describe union with Christ. And Paul, in this section of Scripture, is beginning to explain all that comes to us when we're united with Christ. And he says, by the way, you're switching your union. Your union has been with Adam. You have been vitally connected with the first man, the leader of the human race, the first to come. And now we are moving your your uh, affiliation, your allegiance from Adam to Christ. You are unplugging from your union with Adam and moving to your union with Christ. And he's expecting, as Paul often does through his letters, he'll say something and then he imagines to himself what questions are going to come up because of what I just said. So he makes a statement that says, now I know what you're thinking, you're thinking this. And in this section, he's saying, I've just laid out all of these benefits that come to you as a result of what Christ has done, and I know what you're thinking, how can one man's death, even if there's a resurrection involved, how can that give so much benefit to so many people? How's that possible? I mean, really? So that's what Paul is beginning to address in the second half of Romans 5. Back in World War II, back at the very beginning of World War II, before we were involved in World War II, the German Luftwaffe was flying bombing raids over the city of London. And in fact, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, you know they put the kids on the bus to go out and st- or on the train to go out with their uncle uh, because they want to get them out of London to keep them safe, right? Because they were in danger there. So in those bombing raids, the Luftwaffe was flying over. The the RAF, the British Air Force, was was opposing them. And in the middle of those attacks, Churchill made a speech in August of 1940 to the House of Commons. And in that speech, here's what he said. He said, the gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied by their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of this world war by their prowess and their devotion. Then he said this, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed to so many by so few. Became a famous quote from Churchill. Everybody heard that, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. In fact, they started making these posters here. They just quoted the prime minister and showed the RAF there. Well, what the Apostle Paul is saying in Romans 5 is never in the history of the world was so much accomplished for so many, not by a few, but by one man, by Jesus Christ. Never has there been such a thing. You know, I like to quote from uh, serious Bible teachers, people I've read who uh, have a lot to say on the subject. So I want to quote to you this morning from Romans, an interpretive outline by Curtis Thomas. Here's what he says. He says, Paul's design here is to show that just as the race was condemned on the ground of the imputation of Adam's one sin, even so believers are justified on the ground of the imputation of Christ's righteousness. The central idea of this passage is that men are saved in precisely the same manner in which they were lost through the act of another. Got it? That's the big idea. You were lost because of Adam's sin. You are saved because of Christ's righteousness and his sacrifice. And so the question of can it really be that the death of one man can accomplish so much for so many is a question that Paul wants to say. I'm going to take some time with this, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you some precision on this, and we're going to head into the deep end of this. So we're going to dive into these verses uh, and, and uh, see where we get this morning Stay with me as I read through the passage. Before we read together, let me pray for our time. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we come confessing that we need your spirit to be the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. We need your spirit to make clear what your word says in this passage, and we need your spirit to make clear to us how we ought to respond to what we hear this morning. So I pray that you would speak to our minds and our hearts as we turn to your word And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 5, beginning of verse 12, you follow along as I read. Therefore, 
Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who, uh, over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one's man's, one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. That's dense stuff, isn't it? I mean, just reading through that, you don't read through that and go, oh, I got it. Okay, that makes sense. It takes a little study. Now let me say something about the structure of these verses. Because in reading through it, you don't get the structure right away. Verse 12 is where Paul lays out the main idea he wants to talk about. So he's, talk, he, he's setting up the main idea. One man brought sin and death and it was spread. At the end of verse 12, does your Bible have a dash there or some kind of a, a marking? So that dash is there to say Paul is stopping his thought at that moment and he's going to run a bunny trail. He's got a sub point he wants to make. And so verses 13 and 14 are the first sub point that he wants to make. It's a sidebar. And he says, so sin and death come into the world through Adam. And he says, now some of you are thinking to yourself, wait, what about the law? Don't you have to have the law before you can have sin? I mean, don't you have to know the rules before you can know not to break them? So he stops and he addresses this issue of the law in verses 13 and 14, a little sub point. Then in verses 15, 16, and 17, he's got another sub point. Because at the end of verse 10, he says that Adam is a type of the one to come. And as soon as he says that, he goes, now, now I don't mean that they're parallel. I don't want you to think that Adam and Jesus are on the same plane. So verses 15, 16, and 17, he's saying Adam is a type of Jesus, but they're very different. In fact, Adam is an anti-type more than he is a type. So main thought, stop. Now we've got to talk about the law for a minute. Now we've got to talk about Jesus versus Adam. Then in verse 18, now he's back to his main thought. So when you get to verse 18, verse 18 and he says, Therefore, you could actually draw a line from the end of verse 12 down to the beginning of verse 18, and you would have the thought completing itself after he's run these two bunny trails. That helps you break this passage up and understand it a little bit better. So here's, here's how I want to tackle this, and we're going to go through this whole passage over the, this week and over next week. But I want to talk, as we begin, about two big theological concepts, two big theological ideas that you need to understand as we, if, if we're going to understand this passage. The first idea we're going to talk about is the idea of federalism or federal headship. The second idea is the idea of imputation. Okay, So those are the two things. Let's talk about federalism first. If you had a good social studies teacher when you were in high school, you know that our form of government is not a pure democracy. In a pure democracy, every time there needed to be a decision made, that you'd take a vote, and everybody would have a vote in a democracy. Well, that's not how we do things. The way we do things, we have a republic form of democracy where we vest or we cede the authority to represent us to another person, and that person makes the vote for us. Put up a picture. Anybody know who this guy is? Anybody know him? Who's that? 
That's French Hill. Some of you know that. Anybody know who French Hill is? It would be good for you to know this. He is your representative. He is voting on your behalf in Congress on issues facing us. He is our representative. Now, I'm guessing not everybody in this room voted for French Hill. I'm also guessing that when French Hill votes, sometimes he votes in a way that you wish he didn't vote. Tough, okay? He's your representative. When he votes, he's voting on your behalf. He is representing you even if you disagree with him. That's how federalism works. Look back at verse 12. The passage says, Sin came into the world through one man. Who's that man? Adam. Adam was faced with a decision, obey God or obey my lust, my flesh, my own desires, believe that God knows what's best or think I know what's best. That's the decision facing him. And he says, you know, I'm going to go with me. That's the vote he cast. And by the way, he had a campaign advisor whispering in his ear, telling him what to do, who in fact is the de facto, that campaign advisor winds up being kind of his chief of staff and just keeps whispering, telling him what to do, just keeps pointing him in the wrong direction. He's really kind of a puppet leader, Adam is. Okay, So with that vote, Adam voted, said, I'm going to choose what I want to do. And in that vote, he became your federal representative. He chose not just for him, he chose for all of us. And the verse says, when he did that, death came through sin, death spread to all men because all sin. Now I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking, hang on just a second. I want to impeach the guy, right? He did not vote in a way that was beneficial. In fact, I didn't vote for him. I didn't have any say in the matter. And if I had been there, I would have voted different. Okay, well, now think about this. If you didn't elect Adam to be your representative, who did? Who picked him? God picked him. Okay. Are, are we saying that God picked the wrong guy to represent humanity? God, God picked the guy. God knew everybody he was going to create. God looked at everybody he was going to create, and he said, who's, who's got the best shot of trying to resist temptation here? I'm going with Adam. Now, I'm being anthropomorphic here. You know, we, we're, we're getting the mind of God. I understand that, right? But it's like, if you watch basketball, when there's a technical foul on one team, the coach of the other team gets to do what? He gets to pick the guy who's going to shoot the free throw. So who's he pick? He picks the guy who's best at shooting free throws. Go shoot our free throws for us, right? God did the same thing. He said, okay, we, we got this temptation that is going to come Adam's way. I'm picking Adam to face it because he's got the best chance of resisting. He knew what was going to happen, right? But listen to what R.C. Sproul says about God's choice of Adam to be our representative. Sproul says, there is only one time in all of human history when we have been perfectly, accurately represented and we didn't choose our representative. God chose our representative for us. Adam was the perfect choice for you and me. God holds us accountable for what Adam did because Adam did, in fact, truly, perfectly, and infallibly represent me. He was my candidate. I did not choose him. God did. But again, this is Sproul still. He says, if we suppose that when God chose Adam to represent us, his choice was malicious or foolish or fallible or inaccurate, what are we saying about God? In fact, he says, when we make those kinds of complaints and register those kinds of protests, we are proving how accurate God's choice was because we're assailing the integrity of God making the selection for us and we're revealing our own fallenness in the process. So God looks and says, Adam's going to be the representative of all mankind. He becomes our federal representative, Vote, and his vote uh, it now goes to all of humanity and all of his progeny. There's a lot of theological digging you can do here. There's some folks who look at it and they go, how were we there? Well, we were in the loins of Adam. Okay, well, that's kind of, well, that's a long way, to, but but in a, in a mystical sense, we were present with Adam because we're all a part of Adam's race, right? Other people look at it and go, again, it's just a more of a representative. There's some people who believe, and I don't think this is accurate, but they believe pre-existent souls were there, uh, voting with that. So there are all kinds of theological nuances you can get into here. But I think the best idea is that God says, here's, here's the guy who's going to step forward and represent the team, and he misses the shot. Okay. Next question that comes up then is this. 
how is it that what Adam did has consequences for me? I mean, I understand that Adam should get in trouble for what he did, but you remember when you were in elementary school and the teacher says, okay, because one person did something wrong, the whole class is getting punished. Remember how you felt when that happened? What, what you said, that's not what? Yeah, that's what all of us said at that moment because we don't feel we should have to be accountable for anything anybody else did. That's just not right for us to do that. This is where the word imputation comes in, imputation. The word imputation, interestingly, it's a bookkeeping term in, in the old days. It's about, about crediting something to an account that, that uh, wasn't there in the first place. That's what you, when you impute numbers or you impute funds. So imputation means to apply to one's account. The old King James used the word reckoned, reconciliation, right? He, we're familiar with the idea of imputation because the Old Testament taught the idea of imputation over and over and over again. Every year on the Day of Atonement, a Jewish, a, a Jewish person would go to the temple in Jerusalem with either a couple of birds or with a lamb, a, a spotless, blameless lamb. They would lay the lamb on the altar, and before that lamb was sacrificed, what would they do? The priest would pray that the sins of that person were imputed into the lamb would then sacrifice the lamb and the idea was your sins are forgiven through the death of the lamb. So it's the imputation of your sin into the lamb that was being taught over and over again in the Old Testament. Well here Paul is saying when Adam sinned as our federal representative the sin and its consequences were imputed, transferred to all of mankind. So another example, let's say French Hill votes to increase your taxes, right? And so tax season rolls around, and you look at the IRS and say, I did not want that tax increase. In fact, that's, he didn't vote the way I wanted him to vote, so I'm just not going to pay it, right? So what's going to happen to you? The IRS, are they going to look at that and go, oh, we understand. Okay, you didn't want it. You don't have to pay it. No, you're going to pay it whether you like it or not because your representative voted for it. That's what imputation means. Adam's sin was credited to us. His vote has consequences for all of us. We inherited, as a result of Adam's sin, a propensity in us to all sin, and we face consequences for that first sin, first because of what Adam did, but then we face consequences because we participate in it. In fact, let, let me tell you a story here. I'm going to read to you a section from Redeemer's doctrinal statement. And I remember going through the process of crafting this doctrinal statement back in the, the beginning days of this church. We didn't just import a doctrinal statement from someplace else. We actually sat down and looked at a framework and crafted the words and, and prayed our way through this. whole group of men who were involved in this. Some of you were involved in this. But here's what we say about the fall of Adam. We say the first man, Adam, rebelled against God and fell to Satan's temptation. Then we say this, all creation was affected by Adam's fall, and he and all his descendants became alienated from God and corrupted in every aspect of their being. The Bible calls this act of rebellion and disobedience sin. As a result of Adam's sin, all of his descendants are sinners, condemned to death, unable to remedy their condition. There was a guy who was a part of the church at the time when we were going through this who as he thought about it, and, and by the way, I was grateful that he thought carefully and deeply about it, but he wrote me a note, and he said, I don't know that I agree with that. In fact, here's what he wrote. He said, I take issue with the statement, he and all his descendants became alienated from God. He said, I do believe that all his descendants, Adam's descendants, save one, became alienated from God, and that the sin of Adam represents the rebellion in which all eventually partake but I don't believe that his sin is the sin for which I am charged. Sadly, he says, I was able to arrange my own guilt. Okay, now, his comment to me was a reaction against the idea of imputation. Like many people, it just didn't seem right to this guy that God should hold him accountable or bring punishment for something he didn't do, for something Adam did. Now, I, I think this brother was in some way, not wanting to let himself off the hook. He was saying, I deserve punishment for my own sin. I don't want 
to, to get the idea that I deserve punishment for Adam's sin because somehow that seems to lessen my guilt. I think that was part of what was on his mind, but I also think he didn't like the idea that God would punish one person for the deeds of another. But we have to be careful with thinking like that. Here's why. If you don't think it's right for God to hold you accountable for Adam's sin, what do you think about the idea of God declaring you righteous because of what somebody else did? You see? You see, if Adam's sin, if you say, well, I'm, I'm not going to be held accountable for that, well, how are you going to receive the imputation of righteousness that comes through Christ? Our sin comes by imputation, and so does our salvation. In fact, salvation comes by what's referred to as double imputation. What is imputed to us is the righteousness of Christ. He lived a perfect, righteous life, and that righteousness is now transferred to us so that in Christ, when God looks at you because of your union with Christ, he sees you as perfectly righteous. And you go, but I'm not. You go, I understand that. God understands that. But he has credited to your account the perfect righteousness of Christ. It's been imputed to you. But also, your sin... Just like the people in the Old Testament, their sin imputed to the Lamb, your sin has been imputed to the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world through his once-for-all death. Double imputation. Righteousness imputed to you, sin imputed to Christ. That's how salvation works. So this second half of Romans 5 is all about comparing and contrasting the imputation of Adam with the imputation of of Jesus. What was imputed to you from Adam was sin and death. What's imputed to you in Christ is righteousness and, uh, and uh, justification. That's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so with that understanding of both federal representation and that understanding of imputation, now let's work through the, a few of these verses here, all right? And by the way, I'm going to use an imperfect illustration so keep in mind, I know this is a flawed illustration. You know, when Jesus gave parables, you've got to be careful that you don't read too much into the parable. Don't read too much into my illustration, okay? But the illustration I'm going to use is one of the two things you never talk about at dinner parties. What are the two things you don't talk about at dinner parties? Religion and politics. We're already talking about religion. Let's talk about politics. So the il illustration I'm going to use is this illustration. Paul in Romans 5 is comparing and contrasting two men who are running for leader of the human race. They're candidates. One, he's looking at their track records. He's looking at their promises. He's asking you, which of these two men do you want to align with? Who are you going to vote for? He says, Adam has been our representative for centuries. We're all followers of Adam. You've all been in the party of Adam, which, by the way, is the party of Lucifer, who whispers into the ear. So when you follow Adam, you're going with his Luciferian strategies. He's our great, 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 great grandfather, so it's in the family. We support Adam because he's, I mean, he's one of us. Uh, we're kin, we're blood relatives. We all bear a little resemblance. I mean, right? So we've been under his administration from the beginning. He's been our forerunner and our leader. In fact, I came up with a campaign poster for Adam. Okay, there's Adam's campaign. Adam, he's our man right there. I don't know who that guy is. I just picked him as our representative and put the Obama poster over the top of it. I'm not trying to make a case that Adam and Obama, there's nothing there, okay? All right. But truth be told, as we've said, Adam is a puppet leader. He left the Yahweh party for the Lucifer party, and that's where he's been, in fact, Lucifer's whispering in his ear and Adam's buying it. His policies over centuries have led everyone to sin and death, and sin and death have reigned since Adam took power. Now, Paul says, I've got a new candidate to present to you. The new candidate is Jesus. He is the representative of the Yahweh party, which is back here. Yahweh, he's the leader of the party. He promises justification and righteousness for free, to all who will believe in him, follow him, cast their vote for him. Now, when I say cast your vote, some of you don't like the idea that we talk about, you know, casting your vote. And, and, and I'm not saying, you know, that the, the devil has one vote and Jesus has another and you cast a deciding vote over your life. That's not the idea. Have you ever heard people say that? That's not a good theological way of thinking. But I am saying that we all have to determine who we're going to follow. We're, we're either going to follow Adam and his ways and just kind of default to what comes naturally, 
or we're going to make a deliberate conscious choice to follow Jesus and what he's suggesting. So Paul says, look, you want to keep supporting Adam as your representative? He's a, it's the wrong party. It's the wrong platform. He's a failed candidate and a failed leader. You should take a look at Jesus, what he's offering and what he's promising. So he says, here's what Adam has led to. Here's what his, his reign, is, verse 12, led to sin, de- led to death, death spread to all men. Then we got the first pause. You remember? He says, now I'm going to run a little bunny trail here because I want to talk about this idea of the universality of sin and death. Have you ever thought about the fact that sin and death are common for all people? E- even a secular person would agree that nobody's perfect. You've heard people say that, right? Nobody's perfect. All of us have got sinful patterns or tendencies in our lives. Doesn't matter who they are. There's never been a perfect man except for Jesus. And all of us die. Now, if if this was just something that we were dealing with averages on, you would think over the thousands of years and the millions of people, it would average out so that you'd find a, a couple of perfect people or a couple of people who beat the odds and didn't die, it's not there. It's universal. Everybody messes up and everybody dies. So that's what verse 12 says. It happens because we're all a part of Adam's race. But the sub-point is, wait, wait, time out. How can you say sin reigned when God hadn't yet given the law? Don't you have to have a law in order to have a transgression of the law? It's a good question, right? Sin, by definition, is a violation of God's law. So if the law hasn't been given, how can there be sin? In fact, that's the first half of verse 13. Sin, indeed, was in the world before the law was given. How do you know sin was in the world before the law was given? Because death was in the world before the law was given. And the wages of sin is death. So if death is there, sin has to be there. He's working his way back from that. So if death existed between Adam and Moses, there must have been sin. But this is where the imputation fits in. That sin was in the world, That the, the sin that led to death was Adam's sin that was leading to death. Everybody participated in it, but it was Adam's sin that brought the death. We know that Adam's sin infected his descendants because all of his descendants died. In fact, all of his descendants died even those who were not old enough to volitionally choose to sin. Little babies die. Little babies die before they're ever able to consciously, volitionally, now they may still reflexively sin. Some of you have had little babies, and those little babies demonstrated to you their sinfulness early on. Here's how a little baby demonstrates his reflexive sinfulness early on. When a little baby, when, when you wake up in the night and something is bothering you, as a grown-up, you think, something's bothering me, but I'm not going to disturb anybody else in the house. I'm just going to leave them alone, and I'll deal with it myself. That's because you've grown up. When a little baby wakes up in the night, and something is bothering that baby, what does that baby do? Screams. That baby, let its inflexive sinfulness says, I have something urgent. I, I have, I'm hungry. You must interrupt what you're doing and provide me with food, or I'm uncomfortable. You must stop your sleep, even though you've had very little of it, and deal with my issue immediately. That's that's just instinctive, reflexive sinfulness. But babies can't volitionally choose that. They're not waking up and consciously thinking, you know, I'm uncomfortable, but I should let mom sleep. No, they don't do that, right? So the question of... The fact, or the fact that babies die, we have to understand that they're dying because they're in Adam, because of Adam's sin, because they're a part of this, imp- the, the imputed sin of Adam is present in them before they ever make a sinful choice on their own. That's what Paul is suggesting here when he says that, that, they, that death exists before you can even consciously rebel against the law. Look at verse 14. It says, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one to come. That's an interesting phrase. Death reigns from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. What does that mean? Well, here's what I think that means. There's a difference 
and, and we don't want to put too fine a point on this, but there's a difference between sin and transgression. Sin is any time that you don't live according to the law of God. Transgression is when you know what the law of God is and you choose to violate it. You see the difference? So let's say, as, as an example, if I am driving down a street and I don't know what the speed limit is on that street and I go 50 and a policeman pulls me over and says, it's a 30 mile an hour speed limit. And I say to him, I didn't know. I didn't see any signs. Does he go, okay, all right, well, then you're off the hook. No, he still gives you a ticket. Even though you didn't know, you still sinned. You still broke the law. Okay, But there's a difference between speeding and going, I, I didn't know, and speeding when you say, there's the sign, I'm still going 60 if I want to. That's a transgression. That's a decision to make, to, to trespass, to transgress. So whether you're told something is wrong or not, you still sin when you violate it. But when you're told and you violate, there's an extra layer of guilt that comes with that, isn't there? So what Paul is saying was Adam's sin, was it a violation of something he knew not to do or was he, was he going, I didn't know we weren't supposed to eat that fruit? No, he knew. God had told him, don't do it. He was willingly, volitionally choosing to disobey God. It was a transgression. But then come along a bunch of other people and they say, well, God hadn't given us laws about eating fruit or anything. In fact, we don't have any other law. Now, they do still have another law because God gives us two ways to know what's wrong. One way is his revelation. He tells us, don't do this, do this. But what's the other way he gives us to know what's wrong? Our conscience. You, you've had that situation where you, you're going, this just doesn't feel right. This just, I, I shouldn't be doing this. Little voice talking to you. God gives us a conscience. When you violate conscience, there's one level of guilt there. When you violate what is revelation, there's a second level of guilt there. So Paul in verse 14 is saying the people between Adam and Moses may not have had revelation. They still had conscience. They still had the imputed sin of Adam. They're still guilty. Get the point? Just a comment here. In verse 13 where Paul says sin where sin is not counted where there is no law, we've got to be really careful there. What he's saying is sin is not counted in the same way where there is no law. Sin is not counted the same. It's still counted, but it's not counted in the same way. How do we know that sin is still counted? Well, remember back in, in uh, Genesis 6 when God looks at the world and it's wicked. In fact, here's what he says. God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention on the thoughts of their heart was only evil continuously. They had been fully infected by Adam's sin and they were acting on it. God looks at them. Does he bring judgment? Yeah. He sends a flood and wipes them all out except for Noah and his family. That is God judging them even though the law hasn't come yet. And he's right to do it because they, because of the evil of their heart. Sodom and Gomorrah. Has the law come yet? No. Does God bring judgment on that city for its evil? Yes. So the point is, God still counts your sin against you, but it's counted differently. Whether there's a knowledge, you've had revelation, which, by the way, just it makes the case that people who, who come to church and then reject the gospel, there's an extra level of of uh, guilt on them and a more severe punishment ahead for them than for the people who haven't heard it. Okay, so as soon as Paul makes the point, Adam was a type of the one who would come, the type of Jesus, this is where he says, now wait, I've got to clarify this whole type thing because I don't want you to get the idea that I'm saying that they're, they're like two heavyweight boxers and, and they're equal. So verses 15 to 17 is where he says, I'm going to show you how Actually, Adam is the antitype of Jesus. And that's where we're going to come back to what we're going to pick up next week. Now, here's how I want to wrap up this morning. Here's a question for you. You understand that being justified and reconciled to God 
is imputed. It's not because of anything you've done. It's because of something Jesus did for you. You get that. It's by grace through faith. You respond to God's grace. You say, I will follow you, and God's righteousness is imputed to you. And when that happens, you are united with Christ. So here's the question. If you're united, if you are his bride, if you are his child, if you are his branch, how you doing? We would hope that if you're a husband or a wife, that what's true about you in marriage is that you are faithful, that you're pure, that you're responsive, that you're loving, that you're serving, that you're dedicated to one another. We would hope that's true about husbands and wives. That's what marriage is supposed to look like. Well, if we are married to Christ, we are to be faithful, to be dedicated, to be loving, to be committed, we're to be pure. Is that true about you as the bride of Christ? In, in what areas is that not true? I am an imperfect husband. If you would like a listing, and it's a long one, of the ways in which I do not love and serve Marianne well, she may have it in her purse and may be able to give it to you this morning. I don't know, right? You don't? Okay. I thought maybe you kept a list there, all right? But, but she could come up with some pretty quick on the spot. I'm also an imperfect husband follower of Christ I, I, I am not as faithful as I ought to be I appreciated Jim's prayer this morning of confession because I resonated with my, my failings here thank God for his grace but the inclination of my heart is that I'm married to Christ and, and I want to be faithful and I want to be pure and I want to be committed and dedicated and all of those things what about you is that the inclination is that the impulse of your heart how about the fact that you're a child. What, what should a good child be in a, in a family? Well, you would want a good child to be obedient and to be grateful. I mean, if I'm thinking of two things I want my kids to be, I want them to obey and I want them to be thankful for what I'm doing. Well, what kind of child of God are you? Are you a stubborn, self-willed, rebellious child of God who says, I want it my way? Give me what I want or I'm going to throw a tantrum? Or are you a grateful thankful, obedient child. Union with Christ is accomplished through Christ, but how we live out our union is on us. Got it? How you live as the bride of Christ, that's on you. How you live as a child of God, that's on you. Branches and vine, that illustration. The, the, the key idea of that illustration is that if a branch is grafted into the vine, how do we know that that graft is doing well? There's fruit. There's life. You see the leaves on the end of the branch. You see the fruit hanging down. So is there life and fruit in you? Is there the fruit of the Spirit being produced in you? Is there spiritual fruit as you share Christ with others? Are you the kind of bride that delights the groom? Are you kind of the kind of child who brings joy to his father? Are you the kind of branch that is so borne down with fruit that they have to come pick it off so that you can keep growing more? That's, that's the whole idea here of union with Christ. Christ has imputed to us his righteousness and his justification and brought us union with him. Now the question is, how are we living out that union? So as we read through this passage, it's kind of a dense theological passage, but I think the so what here, I think the practical side of this is to say, we need to remind ourselves, this is who we're in union with because of Christ, what Christ did. If you've aligned with Christ, if you have cast your vote with him instead of your vote with Adam, then how are you living out your citizenship in the new kingdom? And that's a good question for you to meditate on before we come to the table. By the way, this table is a table that's all about our union with Christ. We take bread and juice and put it in us as a picture of union, oneness. It's a picture of our being united with Christ. We read about it in the catechism this morning. It was all about our union with Christ through what we do and what we take in. If you're here this morning as a as a visitor, as a guest, you are welcome to come and take these elements and participate in this Lord's Supper 
as long as you are united with Christ, as long as you're part of the family. This is a family meal for the family of God. So if you would say, I know that I'm a child of God, I know that I'm a grafted in branch to the vine, I know that I am uh, the, the, a part of the, the bride of Christ, I'm one of the, the members of that body, then you're welcome here to take the bread and the cup. If you're here this morning and you're not sure about that, that's still an open issue for you. There's there are things you need to explore or you want to talk about. We're glad you're here. You're in the right place. Don't feel uncomfortable. But I'd just say don't come and get bread and juice. Let the family take that meal while you think about what you've heard this morning. And then let's talk if we need to talk about that, okay? So the way we're going to do this, we're going to come down the outer aisles. We're going to receive the elements. Go back through the center aisle to your seat. Hold on to the elements. We'll take them together in just a minute. You spend time preparing your heart as I prepare at the table. receive as you're ready this morning. are symbols of our union with Christ and just as we read in the catechism this morning this does not become the body of Christ as we take it this does not become the blood of Christ 
in the same way that Jesus said, I am the door, but he's not actually standing on hinges at the entrance of heaven. So when he said, this is my body and this is my blood, he was saying, these are symbols or pictures. They are holy and consecrated symbols. They're profound symbols. And as we take them into us, we're signaling the fact that we are, in fact, united with Christ. Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, took the bread at the Passover meal with his disciples. He prayed a prayer of blessing, then he broke it. He shared it with his disciples. He said, this bread is my body broken for you, and as often as you receive this, remember me. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning, that's what we do. We remember your sacrifice. We remember that your perfect life and your substitutionary death are what give us life and which what pay for our sins. So we receive this bread now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. In the same way, when the meal was over, Jesus took the cup, and after he had prayed a prayer of blessing for it, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. The old covenant had been a covenant that revolved around the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats, but the writer of Hebrews tells us that that blood never took away any sin. It was only a picture to point us to the blood of the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so when Jesus passed this cup, he said, uh, do this in remembrance of me. And this morning, Lord, that's what we do. We remember you and your perfect sacrifice. We remember that our sins those scarlet are now white as snow because of what you've done. And we receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. Now, if you'll stand, we're going to sing the last verse of Holy, Holy, Holy one more time, and then we will uh, be dismissed with a benediction. Holy, Holy, All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in receive this blessing from God with open hands and open hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, abide in peace. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.